Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω το Ελληνικό Ινστιτούτο Βυζαντινών και Μεταβυζαντινών Σπουδών τη Βενετία ε, για την ευγενική πρόσκληση να βρίσκομαι σήμερα εδώ. Παράλληλα, να ευχαριστήσω και τον Φωτο Μήτωρα τη Θεολογική Σχολή του Αριστερού Πανεπιστημίου για την προσφώνηση και την συμμετοχή όλων μέσω αυτού, όλων των συναδέλφων του Αριστερού Πανεπιστημίου στην ε, τριήμερη αυτή ε, εκδήλωση. Τέλος, τους ε, εκπροσώπους του Δήμου Θεσσαλονίκης και γενικά του Δήμου Θεσσαλονίκης για την ε, συμμετοχή και τη συμβολή στην δημιουργία, ε, στην οργάνωση και την εκτέλεση του συνεδρίου. Ε, πολύ σύντομα θέλω να πω ότι ο, ο τίτλος Ευρωπαϊκός Φιλενισμός και η Ελληνική Επανάσταση και η συμμετοχή των συναδέλφων του Αριστοτελείου Πανεπιστημίου στην, ε, στο συνέδριο αυτό είναι μια συνέχεια ουσιαστικά των εορταστικών εκδηλώσεων που είχαμε οργανώσει ως, ως Πανεπιστήμιο για τα 200 χρόνια από την Ελληνική Επανάσταση. Και είχαμε δει την Ελληνική Επανάσταση μέσα από διαφορετικές πλευρές. Είχαμε δει το πώ ξεκίνησε Όλη εκείνη η δράση, τα διδάγματα και οι απόψεις, ο, ακούγοντας και τα τελευταία, ε, τις τελευταίες ε, παρουσιάσεις της, ε, του συνεδρίου αυτού, νομίζω ότι στα συμπεράσματα θα αναπτυχθούν πολύ περισσότερο, ε, το πώς συμβάλλει, το πώς πρέπει σήμερα να βλέπουμε τα διδάγματα της εποχής εκείνης που διαπιστώνουμε, που μπορούμε σε κάθε επίπεδο, σε κάθε βήμα να γίνονται πράξη και φυσικά με τα όλα όσα συμβαίνουν στον περίγυρό μας, στον περίγυρο της Ευρώπης, με τα τελευταία, την τελευταία εισβολή της Ρωσίας στην Ουκρανία, την, την ανθρωπιστική κρίση η οποία δημιουργήθηκε και τέλος όλη την καταπάτηση του διεθνούς δικαίου, πώς λοιπόν όλες εκείνες οι διδαχές είναι σήμερα πολύ έτσι ε, ουσιαστικές ε, και πολύ φωτεινές για όλους μας. Δεν νομίζω ότι τώρα χρειάζεται κάτι άλλο κύριε Πρόεδρε. Νομίζω ότι τα συμπεράσματα θα δείξουν όλη αυτή την παρουσία των 200 λεπτών αυτού του φιλουμινισμού, το πώς ξεκίνησε και το πού έχει φτάσει σήμερα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ο πρώτος ομιλητής είναι ο καθηγητής Βέρδο Ριτόνι, ο οποίος α, βρίσκεται μαζί μας μέσω της διασκέψεως. Ευχαριστώ σας πείτε, ο Προφέσσο Βέρδο Ριτόνι, που will introduce us to the topic where it is entitled Words are things, buyer's role in the Greek Revolution. Uh, Dear Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, of course, yes. Good, thank you. Let, 
I'll just <laughs> begin by sharing my screen. Ah, I want to share my screen, but I'm, it, I'm told the host has disabled screen sharing. So. Okay, thank you very much. So I, um, I'd like to begin by thanking, of course, the Instituto Helenico for inviting me. Um, I'd also like to begin with a, a few a brief apologies. Um, first of all, the, the first apology is the fact that I'm not there with you today. I had hoped to be present, but unfortunately I've come down with COVID. Uh, and so, um, and I hope this will also excuse um, if um, the, a certain lack of energy uh, that might um, come across since I will be dealing with a very energetic poem. Um, the second apology is the fact that unfortunately I don't speak Greek, so I have not been able to follow uh, most of the conference. I'm particularly sorry not to have been able to hear Professor Stamoulis' uh, paper on Child Harold. Um, and the final, um, well, I'll begin, begin by calling it an apology, is um, uh, the title of my subject, Byron's Contribution to the Greek Cause, is a very, very broad topic, and one that has, of course, been thoroughly dealt with by the expert on this topic, uh, Professor Roderick Beaton. Um, so I'd like to begin, in fact, by uh, making a kind of, paying a tribute to, um, um, to Professor Beaton um, for his book, Byron's War, Romantic Rebellion, Greek Revolution 2013, um, which is one of those works that really changes the way we consider the subject. There have been countless biographies of Byron, um, the phenomenon began the year after his death with just about everyone who'd ever had any contact with him rushing into print. And his final months in Greece were particularly well documented, with five books being written about the period by people who were close to him in those days. Now, until um, Rod's book, there was a general consensus that Byron's commitment to the cause of Greek independence was a sort of final romantic gesture, and few people seemed to take his political role very seriously. The great virtue of his study <clears throat> is that he's drawn on an immense amount of Greek archive material, <clears throat> excuse me, not available to most previous biographers, and also, of course, on his extensive knowledge of the history of Greece. And he's thus shown authoritatively the major contribution that Byron made to the cause, um, not just money, not just the gift of his name, um, uh, but a serious uh, and well-compondered well political engagement and commitment, and one that makes all those statues and paintings and streets named after him throughout Greece um, perfectly explicable. Perhaps the most succinct account of the importance of Byron's contribution to the Greek cause can be found in uh, Roderick's uh, more recent book, Greece, Biography of Modern Nation, where he says, what kind of freedom had Byron come to fight for? Having carefully weighed the alternatives, he opted to throw his celebrity reputation and his personal wealth behind Mavrocordatus and the modernizing ship owners of Hydra and Spetses. Of even greater significance in the long run was his decisive support for the modernizers against the warlords of the Peloponnese in the conflict that would drag on for the rest of the year. Now, this wasn't an obvious choice for Byron, because as Beaton points out, one might have expected Byron to have sympathized with the more romantic figures of the warlords, who are apparently so similar to the heroes of the poems that had made his name at the start of his career. Poems like The Jaur, The Bride of Abydos, The Corsair, Lara, the Siege of Corinth, works that everybody read at the time. For example, in Jane Austen's novel Persuasion, her, hero re her heroine reads The Jower and the Bride of Abydos. So Beaton shows how his Byron's early experiences in Greece in his unusual grand tour of 1809 to 1811 brought him into contact after a shipwreck with the Suliots. He came to shore um, after this shipwreck on the coast of Suli um, and encountered these mountain people who spoke Greek, but dressed in the Albanian manner. And therefore, he, um, you might say that this was his encounter with the figure of the cleft, which was undoubtedly crucial in Byron's conception of the Byronic hero. 
But when it came to making a definitive and serious choice of political allegiance in the Greek st struggle, Byron instead went for Mavrokodatos, the bespectacled scholarly figure in European clothes concerned to make Greece a modern nation along Western lines. So this is definitely a new perspective on Byron's relationship with the Greek cause, and one that hadn't been fully appreciated until um, Beaton's book came out. I can't really hope to add anything of significance to the this political and historical debate. And so instead, I'm going to confine myself to examining perhaps Byron's most famous poem on Greek liberty, The Isles of Greece. And even here, I'll draw on Beaton's own discussion of this poem in his book, but I'll try and add some extra literary nuances of my own. Now, the poem is inserted in Canto Three of Byron's great comic epic, Don Juan, and it's the first such interpolation. Byron's manuscripts show that he had begun writing the song in the same stanza form as the rest of the epic, Italian ottava rima in iambic pentameter, but he then switched to a shorter six-line stanza with tetrameter lines rhyming A-B-A-B-C-C. Now this form gives the poem its special rhythmical vigor and epigrammatic quality, and it's often anthologized as a standalone poem, one that represents Byron's support for the Greek cause, a rousing hymn in praise of liberty and self-determination. But the truth is a little more complicated. Let's look at the opening stanza. The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, where grew the war of where grew the arts of war and peace, where Delos rose and Phoebus sprung. Eternal summer gilds them yet, but all except their sun is set. So it begins with a striking line in forceful monosyllabics, and it's noticeable just how many such monosyllabic lines there are in the poem. Where grew the arts of war and peace, I dreamed that Greece might still be free, and when the sun set, where were they? For what is left the poet here, for Greeks a blush, for Greece a tear? Must me but weep or days more blessed? A land of slaves shall ne'er be mine. It's a poem clearly written to be chanted aloud, to be sung indeed, and the overall eff effect is undoubtedly stirring. But what is curious about the poem is its elaborate framing, one of the most curious frames ever created around a single song. And this frame tells us a good deal about the elaboration of Byron's attitudes towards Greece. It's important to note where this poem comes in his career. It was written towards the end of his three-year sojourn in Venice, when he was about to move to Ravenna, after falling in love with the young Countess Teresa Guiccioli. His closeness to Teresa's family, the Gamba family, led to his becoming involved in Italian politics. And indeed, Byron uh, would become so closely involved with the Carbonari movement that he would store weapons for them inside Palazzo Guiccioli in Ravenna, a palazzo that's now becoming uh, being transformed into a museum devoted both to Byron and to the Risorgimento. So it was clear that Byron had grown dissatisfied with his Venetian life and was looking for ways to do something beyond a purely literary career. One testimony came to this in the long poem in Terza Rima, The Prophecy of Dante. This was written in the summer of 1819 at the instigation of Teresa. It's probably his most political poem, consisting of a series of meditations in the, in the voice of the poet Dante, who foretells the rise of a movement for Italian unity. It's in some ways an awkward poem, made even more so by Byron's determination to use the same metrical form as Dante, Terza Rima. He defines the poem a metrical experiment, although it does rise at moments to memorable clarity, as in the final line of the first canto, they made an exile, not a slave of me. Byron's self-identification with Dante is clear, and Dante here, as so often in Risorgimento writings, is taken as a symbol of Italian unity and nationalism. Byron perhaps aspires to play such a role in his own works. So that is the biographical context of our song. As for the immediate literary context, the, the song is situated, as already noted, in his great comic epic, Don Juan. Now, Byron's greatest gifts were for comedy rather than tragedy, and he found a better vehicle for these gifts in the Ottava Rima stanza, adopted by Ariosto and Tasso, than in the more constricting Terza Rima of Dante. And as his hero, he chose the figure of Don Juan, or Don Juan, as Byron pronounces it, which allowed him to create an episodic poem following his hero around the Mediterranean. After Juan leaves his native Spain, the ship he is sailing on is wrecked on a Greek island, and here he falls in love with a young Greek girl, Heidi, daughter of Lambro, the pirate chieftain who rules over the island. 
While her father is away, believed dead, Heidi and Dewan host a party, during which a bard sings the Isles of Greece. So this is the literary setting for this extraordinary arousing song, which creates a very different mood in the poem. But what is particularly odd is what we're told about the poet who sings this song. He is, we are told, a sad trimmer, which is to say one who sits on the fence, an opportunist. There's possibly also a reference to the fact that the poet Southey, poet laureate, a poet frequently attacked by Byron, was said to be married to a milliner of Bath, a trimmer. And there's a clear reference to this in a, in a later stanza in the poem. The description of the poet is often taken to be a satirical portrait of Southey, but some of the description could apply equally well to Byron himself. Byron was aware that some of the works that had made him popular, specifically those Eastern tales I listed earlier, were not of the highest level. He would describe them, in fact, in a, in a letter as the exaggerated nonsense which has corrupted the public taste. And Byron, unlike Southey, had, as the, he, uh, the poet he describes here, traveled amongst the Arabs, Turks and Franks, and knew the self-loves of the different nations, and having lived with people of all ranks, had something ready upon most occasions. It's to be noted that the poet is described as metrically skillful, like Byron, his verses rarely wanted their due feet, his fault is his lack of constancy, and more to the point, a complete lack of any real um, belief system. He was a man who had seen many changes and always changed as true as any needle, his polar star being one which rather ranges and not the fixed. He knew the way to wheedle. So vile he scaped the doom which oft avenges, and being fluent, save indeed when feed ill, he lied with such a fervour of intention, there was no doubt he earned his laureate pension. Uh, the last line clearly suggests Southey as the butt of the joke, but there's also something more complex going on here. This isn't just an easy attack on a despised rival. We have the sense that Byron is coming to some kind of self-reckoning. The whole situation has been building up to this. We're on a Greek island with Juan and the young Heidi engaged in an illicit love affair, soon to be broken up by the arrival of Heidi's father. There are parallels to the poet's own position dallying with his lover, Teresa, with Teresa's husband looming menacingly in the background. In his imagination, as he composes his mock, mock epic, Byron returns to the locations of his youthful travels. And he creates a kind of comic or even a cynical version of the romantic adventures he had conjured up in those settings. This time, Teresa's father, Lambro, is a realistic and a grimly realistic version of the bandit-like figures he had idealized in those poems. Byron is playing a curious game between romance and realism, just as his poet figure here finds himself inspired for once to tell the truth. He deemed, being in a lone isle among friends, that without any danger of a riot, he might for long lying make himself amends, and singing as he sung in his warm youth, agree to a short armistice with truth. An interesting expression that, an armistice with truth. So he's a liar who's going to see what it's like to tell the truth as he wants it in his warm youth. However, the stanza that actually precedes the song itself presents it as yet another example of his chameleon-like qualities with a wonderful form of final comic rhyme. In France, for instance, he would write a chanson, in England, a six canto quarter tale. In Spain, he'd make a ballad or romance on the last war, much the same in Portugal. In Germany, the Pegasus he'd prance on would be old Goethe's, see what says de style. In Italy, he'd ape the Trecentisti. In Greece, he'd sing some sort of hymn like this to you. Notice uh, that conditional form, he'd sing, he would sing. This will be emphasized at the end of the song. And if, as I say, there is also that comic rhyme, Trecentisti, hymn like this to you but also that disparaging some sort of hymn. And this precedes the glorious explosion of stirring patriotic sentiments. Or is that what they are? The first two stanzas for all their ringing tones are about what is not there. This first stanza, which we've already read, that for all the sense of immediacy in those urgent repetitions, the Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, the verbs describing the glories of Greece are all firmly in the past, loved, sung, grew, rose, sprung. Only in the final rhyming couplet do we reach the present, which is essentially just a tribute to Greece's climate. 
after rising and springing, the final verb in the present tense is set. And notice the wonderful choice of epithet for Sappho, burning Sappho. This took Byron a little time to find, beautifully complementing the other images of sunlight in the stanza, Phoebus Apollo being the god of both song and the sun. The Scian and the Teian muse, the hero's harp, the lover's lute, have found the fame your shores refuse. Their place of birth alone is mute to sounds which echo further west than your sire's islands of the blessed. So in this second stanza, tribute is paid to Homer, the Scian, and Anacreon, the Teian, the great epic poet and the great lyric poet, both therefore relevant to this particular poem, a lyric inserted in an epic, even if a comic one. Indeed, the point would seem to be that these singers are no longer heard in their native realm, but have moved further west, further west than even Hesiod's islands of the blessed, to islands unknown to these poets, perhaps islands in the distant North Atlantic. The mountains look on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the sea, and musing there an hour alone, I dreamed that Greece might still be free, for standing on the Persian's grave, I could not deem myself a slave. A king sat on the rocky brow, which looks o'er seaborn Salamis, and ships by thousands lay below, and men in nations, all were his. He counted them at break of day, and when the sunset, where were they? So we move from poetry to history, and also to personal reminiscence. For now, Byron the poet seems deliberately to merge with his strange bard-like figure, the trimmer, as he recalls his visit to the site of the Battle of Marathon in January 1810. And in these two stanzas, he balances personal and meaningful memory with historical fact, presenting the latter in highly effective and compressed dramatic form. In the last line of stanza three, I could not deem myself a slave, there's perhaps an echo of that heroic line that concluded the first canto of his prophecy of Dante. They made an exile, not a slave of me. <clears throat> in the next stanza, stanza five, um, we get a, that despairing question asked by Xerxes, where are they? This is now taken up by the poet, and where are they, and where art thou, my country? On thy voiceless shore the heroic lay is tuneless now, the heroic bosom beats no more, and must thy lyre, so long divine, degenerate into hands like mine? So as I say, that question is taken up by the poet. Is it the poet Byron, or is it this trimmer figure? With a sudden sense of his own unworthiness, and more particularly of his own inability to revive the heroic lay. Evocations of Thymopylae in the next few stanzas prove fruit fruitless, as they are answered only with silence. silence. And so, to leap forward to stanza nine, midway through the 16 stanzas, the poem suddenly takes a different turn. It had begun by evoking the spirits of both Homer and Anacreon, epic and lyric. In stanza nine, having accepted the impossibility of reviving the heroic strain, the poet suddenly turns to a particular kind of lyric for which Anacreon was famous, the drinking song. In vain, in vain, strike other chords, fill high the cup with Samian wine, leave battles to the Turkish hordes, and sh shed the blood of Scio's vine. Hark, rising to the ignoble call, how answers each bold bacchanal. The ringing tones are now used for very different purposes. Is it pure um, hedonism? It's referred to very specifically as an ignoble call. And this cup with Samian wine, we remember that the Samians were blamed for defeat in the Sea Battle of Lade in 494 BC against the Persians, their ships having been the first to leave the battle. And so this, the heroic um, tones are here clearly highly ironic. And we have the sense that there are two voices speaking in the poem. And this becomes even more intense as the stanza is answered by this one. Uh, we get a stanza first of apparent carefree joviality, and now we get this one of stern criticism. You have the Pyrrhic dance as yet, where is the Pyrrhic phalanx gone? Of two such lessons, why forget the nobler and the manlier one? Now, while one hesitates to attach the adjective Puritan to Byron, uh, there does seem to be something peculiarly personal in these strictures here, since Byron's dislike of dancing, owing to his club foot, is well known. 
And this curious alternation of voices continues for the remaining five stanzas, each summons to fill high the bowl with Samian wine, being responded to by a sterner command, frequently an admonitory one. The penultimate stanza begins with the repeated refrain, fill high the bowl with Samian wine. Our virgins dance beneath the shade, I see their glorious black eyes shine, but gazing on each glowing maid, my own the burning teardrop laves, to think such breasts must suckle slaves. This time the image of the dance uh, is taken up, um, it seems at first erotically charged, but then it becomes tragic as the singer concludes with yet another rhyme on the word slave, though this time significantly in the plural. The last stanza is the most intriguingly ambiguous. Place me on Sunium's marble steep, where nothing save the waves and I may hear our mutual murmurs sweep. There, swan-like, let me sing and die. A land of slaves shall ne'er be mine. Dash down yon cup of Samian wine. So this final stanza turns literally into a swan song. After all those hearty perorations and imperatives, the poet chooses a place of striking beauty and loneliness, um, a place that Byron had visited in January 1810. He had notoriously signed his name on the temple. Uh, and here the music fades to mutual murmurs produced by both the singer and the waves. Only in the final couplet do we have an apparent return to the exhortatory mode that characterizes most of the poem, with a curious and ambiguous twist on the anacreontic refrain. A land of slaves shall ne'er be mine, dash down yon cup of Samian wine. Uh, Roderick Beaton, in fact, says in his uh, uh, study of the poem, are the hearers being urged to throw down the cup untasted in an act of defiance? or only to drain it dry and accept their inglorious lot. Uh, so there is something ambiguous about that dash down yon cup of Samian wine. And this ambiguity, I think, is very telling about the poem uh, as a whole. Uh, so as the song concludes, we return to the outer frame, that is the adventures of Don Juan, and the lines that follow are curiously distancing. Thus sung, or would, or could, or should have sung this modern Greek intolerable verse, if not like Orpheus quite when Greece was young, yet in these times he might have done much worse. His strain displayed some feeling, right or wrong, and feeling in a poet is the source of others' feelings, but they are such liars, and take all colours, like the hands of dyers. We notice in the opening line the odd parade of conditional forms, would or could or should, and we remember how the song began. He'd sing, he would sing some sort of hymn like this to you. Perhaps it's worth noting the final auxiliary is should, which expresses a kind of moral judgment. But perhaps what is more worth noting is the way the alternation of voices and judgments continues in the stanza and then into the next, into the um, subsequent 17 stanzas until the end of the canto, with some of the most fascinatingly, fascinatingly digressive verse in the whole notoriously digressive poem. Beaton, in his discussion of the song, focuses particular, particularly on the opening lines of the next stanza. But words are things, and a small drop of ink falling like dew upon a thought produces that which makes thousands, perhaps millions, think. This um, words are things. This is not a new concept. It's one he took from the French writer Mirabeau and he quotes it elsewhere in his letters and in other poems. Beaton says, it turns out that Byron is thinking not about words as the motive for action, but rather more subtly that history is all in the telling. Even the most heroic or inspired action is given meaning only through being memorably told. By way of conclusion, I think it fair to say that Byron was at a moment of his life when he was having to make a number of difficult choices. There were the complications of his love life, his commitment to Teresa, to Teresa. There was the question of his literary development. He realized the new kind of poetry he was writing in Don Juan was superior to the melodramatic stuff that made him so popular. It was not just wittier, more acute in, his sat in its satire, but also more authentic. It wasn't just written for the audience of the moment, as with the trimmer. Uh, but to make things more personally complicated, it turned out that Teresa didn't like this kind of poetry either and would beg him to stop writing it. So along with these literary ambitions, um, these conflict, these personal conflicts, there came the question of whether a life based solely on literature was enough for him. 
and hence the seeking of worthy political causes. Greece's condition of subjection to Turkish power had stirred him during his youthful visit, and in these stanzas of Don Juan, he returns to those youthful memories. One aspect of the confusion of voices is that of conflicting pressures from the past and the present, voices of youthful idealism and those of middle-aged cynicism. It makes for an intriguing mixture. Byron isn't yet committed to the Greek cause, but he's ripe for conversion. And as Professor Beaton shows, his disillusionment with the Italian cause, the Carbonari, along with the influence of his Philhellenic friend Chile, would prepare the way for him to look eastwards for a worthier cause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for your nice contribution, which will give as a popular opinion for this question then. Στο σημείο αυτό, κύριε Σιετή, θα ήθελα να περάσουμε στο επόμενο σύγχυση, να καλωσορίσουμε τον επίτιμο πρόξενο της Ελλάδας στην Ενεργία, κύριο Μπρούνο Βενάρτη, και να τον παρακαλήσουμε να έρθει στο Λίμα για να μην mio compiacimento e la mia gratitudine per la scelta del tema uh, Words are Things, che ricordava il collega ora, e sulla scia di questa visione bayroniana ci rendiamo conto che una gran parte del nostro lavoro, del nostro lavoro anche come consolato onorario, consiste proprio nel sostenere quella tensione uh, del filo ellenismo che uh, è oggetto del vostro studio di questi tre giorni. Eh, io non vorrei aggiungere altro a questa eh, sessione di studio. Eh, come vecchio collega, sia pure di altra area scientifica, eh, mi rendo conto di cosa voglia dire organizzare eh, un convegno internazionale, quindi a maggior ragione avete tutto quanto il mio appoggio e se posso dire la mia affettuosa partecipazione. Ancora buon lavoro, arrivederci. Η κυρία Αναστασία Τσακάρα, η οποία είναι διδάκτορα ιστορία του Γαλλικού Πολιτισμού, απόφυτο του Μάτου Γαλλικού Πολιτισμού, η οποία είναι στο Εθνικό και κάτω από τι ΕΕΠΑ και στο Εθνικό, η οποία είναι στο Εθνικό και Από το 2009 ασχολείται συστηματικά με την ΕΕΠΑ και από του Φιλέγγου Συνεχιστέ, με εξελίξει στο έργο των Γάλλων Φιλεγγών στον Εθνικό Στρατό και στο νεοσύστατο ελληνικό κράτο. Είναι συγγραφέα των δεκτυπωτικών μου κοινωνικών άρθρων, γνώσεων και παράλληλα ασχολείται επαγγελματικά με την κατάσταση με το σπαλλιό μια έκδοση των ελληνικών δικτύων ορολογία τη ελληνική κοινωνική εταιρεία για τον ελληνικό και τον φιλελληνισμό. Κυρία Τσακαράκη, θα μα παρουσιάσει το θέμα και δεν είναι το μέτρα σε το οποίο θα μπορούσε το Trader Market of Ελίκο Φορνέζη, για να το πω ελληνιστή. Έχετε το λόγο. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Καταρχά, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Το τίτλο είναι λίγο δύσκολο. Από το θέμα και τι λέμε. Ένα movement that contributed to the success of the Greek struggle, Philalism was triggered in 1821 with the outbreak of the revolution. It was at that time that fighters from all over the world ran to enroll in the first regular army of the Mitros Xilantis, driven by Philalenic feelings. Hermi Fornesi, the biographer of Philalens, in his list of Philalen fighters, which I recently had the honor of transcribing and translating from French into Greek, published by Parisiano Editions, 
includes biographical information for a total of 423 fuel But who was Fornesi? He was a Finland from Vo, Switzerland, where he earned his life as a schoolmaster for several years. Leaving a considerable fortune behind him, he came in Greece. He came to Greece in July 1828 to assist the revolutionaries with his educational expertise, as he was fluent in speaking ancient Greek and was firmly convinced that he could easily learn modern Greek. The spark that led him to this spontaneous decision was in fact an announcement he read in a French journal published by the great Swiss philologist Jean Gabriel Eina, who later <coughs> assisted him with money in the recommendation letter to the governor Capodistrias. But for Nessi, it was not only this. He had also been a Philadelphian warrior himself, who took part in a series of battles of the Greek struggle before finally being engaged in the Greek martial court as a reporter. Moreover, he was a writer, a translator, a journalist, and a man, married to a Greek woman whose children remained in Athens and became Greek citizens. And although he developed a variety of activities and featured as a multifaceted personality, he went down in history mainly for the list of Philippines he set up. And here is how all this began. Most of us are aware of the Hilarion to the Ark in the Catholic Temple of Napoleon, a wooden dog monument inaugurated on the 21st of July in the calendar, 1841, the words of which commemorate the names of several hundred Philippines who died for the independence of Greece. As Fonesi himself explained in the introduction of his work entitled The Monument of Philippines, he was, I quote, completely aligned to the original idea that inspired it as this belonged to the French Philippine colonel Touré. Touré, who had been constantly expressing the regret for the loss of some of his most intimate friends, Philippine combatants, conceived the thought to raise at one of the places where they had given their lives for Greek freedom and regeneration, a modest memorial that testified this sacrifice. He believed he had to submit his idea to his majesty King Otto, who, after embracing it warmly, nevertheless manifested the desire that a more general character were given to the project. That is to say, that it extended, as far as possible, to a gathering of biographical information and established facts relating to the memory of the Philippines who had died for Greek independence or who had contributed to it militarily. Invited since then by Colonel Touré to join my great efforts for his rights with his own, we double common with zeal, without avoiding for many years neither research nor even sacrifices in order to achieve this goal. This is how the Touré's catalog was born in 1841. But Fornesi continued to work on the list as he states. Later, reduced to my own strength, I continued the task of which I now publish the result, whatever it may be. The property of this labor having been recognized to me by my former friend and collaborator before his death, dating back to August 28, 1857. Thus, he produced another version of the catalog of dead Philippines, which I chose to call as his original in 1859. Yet another in 1860, which is the monument of Philippines. The different parts of these two works are shown here. First, we have the original catalogs with 286 persons that 
Then I call the title. We have the Monument of Philolens or summary CVs and historical notes about the Philolens for whom it is known to have died for the independence or in the service of Greece from 1821 until today. About those who abandoned it during the same period. And finally, regarding the small number of those still in Greece today in 1860. As well as the memorial ceremony and inauguration of the monument of Philippines. Speaking of a total of 423 persons, an astonishing and unknown information to note here is that this work, publicly known as the monument of Philippines, was in reality part of a translation for Nessie made of the history of the Greek regular corpse by the well-known Christos Visandrios in French. And although an announcement of the publication of this translation <coughs> appeared in Greek press, the book seems not to have been published, not even in 1860, and still today, no copy of it has ever been traced. Some recipes of the Monument of Philippines, as they are stated, comprise of biographical notes regarding the warriors, providing information about their place of origin, their place or battle of death, if applicable, their past, and finally, their activity in the Greek army as well as comments on their posture and personal behavior. The length of the notes varies and depends, of course, on the information available. Where information could not be found, this is explicitly stated in a comment by the writer. Naturally, entries of the first original catalog of dead villains are shorter than the corresponding ones of the Monument of Villains as this work followed and completed the original catalog. But why is this manuscript or other manuscripts important? Simply because it's a small, yes, but unequivocally a sincere contribution to the establishment of the historical truth of the time as it is written by a person who actively participated in the military events, an eyewitness who knew personally the Philippines themselves or the families of the Philippines he was writing about. Moreover, it is the first ever completed document of the kind, providing an overall, if yet incomplete, as Fornesi courageously admits, summary of information on these individuals. More importantly, French Philippine and fighter Tourette, in his effort to be accurate when drafting the first catalog assisted by Fournessy, kept an open line of communication with all European monarchs and the, the ministries of defense, which provided details on the combatants. This fact, revealed by the Tourette correspondence stored in the archives of Greece, clearly demonstrates the importance of the endeavor. That is the reason why, for Nessie, in the introduction of the monument of Philippines, declares with outstanding pride that the summary CVs are in fact real death certificates of prominent or forgotten Philippines for whom their families were seeking information and therefore he personally guarantees their address. So, in total, Fornesi, in the list of dead Philippines, includes 286 individuals whose country of origin can be shown on the table here. Among those who fought and then left Greece, he includes 121 individuals whose country of origin can be shown on the table here. Finally, in those who were still in Greece in 1860, he includes only 16. As regards Italy in particular, in his list, Fornesi includes 89 Italian-speaking prominent fighters.
In the list of dead Philadelphians, he includes 59 persons, eight Corsicans, 25, 27 from Sardinia, nine from Lombardy, Veneto, and Trieste, areas which he attributes to Austria, one from the Duchy of Parma, one from the Duchy of Tuscany, one from the Duchy of Modena, five from the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, three from the Papal States, and four from the rest of Italy. Among those who fought and then left Greece, he includes 24 persons, four from the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, 11 from Sardinia, one from the Duchy of Tuscany, one from the Duchy of Piacenza, one from the Papal States, five from the part of Italy he attributes to Austria, and one from the rest of Italy. Finally, in those who were still in Greece in 1860, he includes only six, two from Sardinia, one from the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, two from Corsica, and one from the Papal States. But the truth is, there were many more. For instance, Casimatis Manolo speaks of a total of 137 persons. However, since we are in Venice, I would like to provide our distinguished audience with some information on the low part of Venetian fighters that took part in the Greek Revolution, modest figures one could have never had before, but who therefore sacrificed their life for us to live free. Both regions of Venice and Lombardy constituted the Lombard of Venetian kingdom, a kingdom forming an integral part of the Austrian Empire from 1815. More specifically, in Philadelphia, who died fighting on the Greek battlefield, or for Nancy includes Catania Antonio from Milan, Lombardy, with the following notes, I quote. He died in Athens from illness on the 17th of April, 1853. He participated in most of the campaigns and operations of the regular corps under Javier, both in the infantry and the artillery. He took part, among others, in the sheds of the Acropolis forces in Chios. A military man of proven bravery, he had, however, sometimes escaped the limits of appropriate military discipline. Unfortunate circumstances led to his removal from the military ranks. He was a captain, and what is strange about him is that while in the documents of the Greek administration he passes as an Italian, Spanish researchers claim that he was a Spanish. Adolini Francesco from Borgo Forte near, near Mandova, Veneto. He died in Athens from cholera on the 16th of November, 1854. Having come to Greece in the early months of the Greek Revolution, he attended and was wounded with a bullet in his neck at the Battle of Petta on the 16th of July, 1822. One of the most eager to become part of the regular corps since its establishment by the Middlesex Silanti, he was constantly standing out by his military training and the encouragement that as an artillery officer, he inspired to all his subordinates. His personal character, simple and loyal, earned him the general affection, made him even more valuable in the eyes of all of his brothers in arms, and turned his loss deeply regrettable to each one of them. He died as a retired squadron chief, decorated with the Medal of the Savior and the Military Medal having left three sons under the flag of his adopted homeland. Forty from Lombardy, he died in Isologi from illness on the 26th of May, 1824. He was one of the few Philippines who had escaped Peta's defeat. Dr. Henry Triber writes that he, he was a pharmacist that uh, had assisted him in the autopsy and embalming of Lord Byron's body. Nyowidowicz from Venice, he died at Peta on the 16th of July, 1822. He had first commanded an artillery battery at the Siege of Polizar in 1821. About him, although Scott and Bookville mentioned he came from Venice, Elster notes that he was a Polish 
he had the join the German Legion and his first name was Antonio. Montanelli from Brescia, Venetian Lobert. He died in Africa from illness in September 1825. Engineer of the Military School of Paris, he was commissioned by the chief of the army, Fabier, to fortify the mills near Napoleon. His uh, first name was Giovanni. Pecorara Antonio, knight, from Pavia of Venetian Lobert. He died at the Battle of Haidari on the 20th of August, 1826. He was commanding the company of horsemen that were on foot at that battle. A count that came to Greece in 1826. Torricelli from Milan. He died at Petra on the 16th of July, 1822. He was a volunteer in the Corps of Philippines. His wife, a Spanish, who had followed him to Greece, died in Missolonghi. The name of his wife was Anna, and his own name was Giovanni Battista. In those who took part in the struggle and then left Greece, we find four persons. Cornero from Venetian Lombardy, with no other detail added, with no other details added. Londonio from Venice, who had to necessarily leave the regular body during the Hill campaign, and he had served in the Navy. Pechio uh, from Venetian Lombardy, with no other information added, but it is known, however, that Pecchio Giuseppe Count, a political science and a strongly erudite person, was a condemned Italian revolutionary who had been in Spain and left his exile in England to go to Greece in 1825. Author of many works, he wrote with enthusiasm about Greek in a work in Title A Picture of Greece in 1825, co written with Emerson James Tennant in Hardface, published in English, French, and Greek, but was greatly disappointed when he arrived in Athena. There is, there is some uh, correspondence of him in the Macrocordatus Archive. Um, Poro Count from Milan. One of the victims affected by the federal revolutionary effort in favor of Italian independence in 1821, of which he was one of the most active and committed pioneers, exiled and condemned together with so many other friends of him, such as Silvio Pelco, Ponfa Lionieri, etc. Count Polo, after wandering in exile, came to Greece in 1825 and attached to Fabien, who appointed him superintendent of the regular corps. These tasks, which due to the abundance of the resources required complex procedures, could not have been assigned to hands that were more impeccable and disinterested than his. His name was Luigi and died in Paris in 1860. And we find a lot of his official letters in the military archives in Greece. Vita Sola from Venice, the dedicated doctor of Lord Byron, as Fornesi notes, also mentioned by Lord Byron in his journal. And finally, in the very few who remain permanent in Greece, we do not trace someone. But Fornesi does state that Almeida Antonio Figuera, coming from Elbas, Portugal, died in the waters of Battaglia, Battaglia Terme, on Venetian Lombardy, from a disease on the 21st of July, 1847, as a retired major general. The information we have on most of these specific persons in the manuscript is pretty limited, but hopefully strongly reliable and to a certain degree trustful. Finally, in our book, which is prefaced by His Excellency, the Ambassador of Switzerland to Greece, are uh, transcribed from French manuscript and then translated into modern Greek. For the first time, all the catalogues of Philippines compiled by the Swiss for less. Until now, all French catalogues remain unpublished. No have all ever been translated in Greek in 1884. The work is framed by a thorough research on the Fornesi family, both in Switzerland and Greece, 
performed by the publisher, Mr. Papayu, and is complemented by rich commentary on the history of the manuscript and the existence of other catalogs of equivalents by other authors by myself. I would be more than glad to offer a copy of the book to those who may be interested. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kukusas for inviting me to speak, and I'm delighted also to be the last speaker. So this is something I have to look forward to. At the end of my talk is also a moment of, of freedom itself. So one may, one may distinguish two types of Hellenophilia during the Greek War of Independence of 1821, a romantic and a practical one. In the previous papers, one has heard examples of the first type. I would like to focus on the second. Castlerin was an enigmatic person. Among the greatest achievements of his career are lines of poetry, not by him, but about him. Lord Byron, from about whom we've heard uh, from Gregory Dowling, among others, a uh, hero of the Greek War of Independence, who died in Missolonghi in 1824, did not like him. In a letter he wrote to Murray on the 20th of January, 1819, he indicated that the stances that he'd written about Calcere could be dropped out if they didn't pass the censorship. He referred to him most memorably as an intellectual eunuch. Byron wrote the letter from Venice. The animosity felt by Byron may be considered uh, something English, since one of the criticisms of Castlereagh is that he spoke English with an Irish accent and was of Ulster Presbyterian background. They had different views on several topics. Castlereagh had put an end to the Irish rebellion in 1798, unified Great Britain and Ireland in 1801, masterminded the Sixth and Seventh Coalition, which defeated Napoleon at Leipzig and Waterloo, 1813 and 1815. He chose St. Helena as the emperor's place of exile, and by leading the Congress of Vienna, he had redefined the status quo of Europe after 23 years of constant war, 1792 to 1815. These are controversial topics, of course. However, Byron may have appreciated some details, such as the fact that Castlereagh decided to send back the horses of St. Mark to Venice, had Wellington removed them from Paris and accompanied them by Sir Ralph Dowling, where they arrived in December 1815. And that's what this painting commemorates. That's why you see the Austrian flags. All three of these people were Irish Protestants. Indeed, the restitution of the works of art to Italy, which Castlereagh decided on the 11th of September 1815, was used as the main legal precedent at the Nuremberg trials in 1946 for the topic of restitution of confiscated property in wartime. Byron was a poet abroad. Castlereagh was a politician. It was Castlereagh's duty to assess the relation between the United Kingdom and Greece, since he was Secretary of State from 1812 to 1822. He was in charge of foreign affairs for those 10 crucial years. Indeed, the Greek War of Independence started when he oversaw foreign affairs for the UK. He was therefore a concerned observer. Castlereagh's position was clearly in favor of preserving the status quo. 
That meant that he promoted the balance of power as established at the Congress of Vienna in 1815. That meant that the UK opposed revolutionary movements. This was the tradition of such Irish thinkers as Edmund Burke in his reflection on the revolution of France published in 1791. Kalsvar's position concerning Greece changed over time. In July 1822, by the way, 200 years ago this year, he decided that Greece should be considered a de facto state, if not de jure. He expressed this in his official notes prepared for the Congress of Verona, planned for October 1822. These formed a document of the official position of the UK government and had been approved by Parliament on the 6th of July, 1822. They were brought and used by his fellow Irishman, Wellington, to Verona when the Congress finally met. The text reads, and I read out the passage which you see in the PowerPoint. What most merits attention at the present moment as bearing upon the future of the negotiation is the degree in which the Ottoman naval power has been paralyzed in the Levant. The total inactivity to which the Turkish commanders in the Maria have been reduced from the failure of all naval support. The consequently probable fall of some of the principal Turkish fortresses and the progress made by the Greeks towards the formation of government. This latter circumstance exhibits a new and altogether distinct view of the character of the contest. So long as the force of the insurgents was directed by the mere will of their leaders, the principle of neutrality led to no other consideration than giving an equal rule of accommodation to the parties. But the erection of a government admitting of formal acts being done on the part of that government, we're no more, we are more positively brought to deal with them de facto upon matters of blockade and other questions dependent upon the law of nations. Castle in this paragraph makes two striking points. Greece should be considered an independent country and granted belligerent status. Greece is not simply an uprising since it has a constitution and a government. These two points indicate that Castlereagh had followed two main developments. The adoption of the Greek constitution, which came into effect on the 1st of January, 1822. The second was the massacre of Chios in the spring of 1822. If the UK recognized Greece as belligerent, it meant that Castlereagh thought that any reaction after Chios could be considered a war between two separate and different countries. The language appears rather timid. However, it is a, ra a radical change from his position before, when he terms non, which he terms non-intervention. In other words, the constitution, the government, and Hios had tipped the balance which he felt was there before. Indeed, Castlereagh's position in 1821 was clearly one of non-intervention in the internal affairs of other states. This is one of the principles on which countries agreed to, in, to the Congress system. Some uh, countries were, in some cases, unjustly partitioned, carved up, and attributed to others. But once that had been completed, the great powers agreed not to intervene in the internal affairs of each other. For Castlereagh, Greece was different in 1822. One may wonder why the balance had not changed before. Indeed, Castlereagh had dealt directly with Capodistrias at the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Capodistrias later became an important figure in Greece and was head, uh, first head of state in 1827. Uh, by the way, these two paintings are in the Waterloo Chamber in Windsor Castle. Castlereagh liked him as he wrote to his brother Charles. He liked Capodistrias, quote, very much and as a minister and a man of business, unquote. 
And for those of you who are interested in, uh, in uh, Ion, Ionian matters, he wrote that letter the day after the signature for the creation of the uh, United States and the Ionian Islands. So it's, at the, it's exactly after the negotiation had been completed with Kapodistia. So he's saying he liked him and that he could deal with him uh, after he had effectively uh, dealt with him. This opinion is not at all obvious since the Austrian foreign minister, Metternich, had an opposite view of Kapodistrias, which I quote because it's rather funny. Kapodistrias is not a bad man, but honestly speaking, he's a complete and thorough fool, a perfect miracle of wrongheadedness. He lives in a world to which our minds are often transported by a bad nightmare. And he wrote that in 1819. This is also to show that there's a different opinion between Castlereagh and Metternich on what concerns Greece. The understanding of Kapodistrias and Castlereagh converged on several points. That would have been even before the Congress of Vienna, where they have uh, known each other uh, better. Castlereagh therefore was aware, aware of matters in Greece uh, directly. He opposed Greek independence, until the constitution was enacted and after the mass, uh, massacre of Hios. The United Kingdom recognized Greece after the Battle of Narino with the London Protocol only in 1830. That was a full eight years after Castlereagh's suggestion. If the British were generally slow at accepting Greek independence, why did Castlereagh support it already in July 1822? The answer is his Irish background. He claimed Greece could be considered independent because it had a constitution and a government. This is exactly the point made by Edmund Burke in 1791 about France and the revolution. He claimed that the glorious revolution, which occurred in England in 1688, was different from the French Revolution of 1789. Since the first upheld uh, laws and constitution, and Burke gives example of the Magna Carta, among others, while the French Revolution was based on new abstract ideas. Both Castlereagh and Burke were proposing that the rule of law was an essential element of stability. Indeed, one may say that in Ireland, the debate for them was not about legal structure, but about injustice of individual laws. So it's important to retain a legal framework while improving individual laws. The constitutional issue was crucial for Castlereagh and Capodistrias, who exchanged letters in 1819 and 1820 about the status quo of the islands uh, west of Greece, organized at the time as the United States of the Ionian Islands, since the Treaty of Paris on the 5th of November, 1815. The letters are very interesting because the uh, Kapodistas is arguing procedural questions of the various constitutions of the Ionian Islands before 1815 in terms of the new treaties. And so Castle gives an answer to that. <clears throat> These islands were part of a British protectorate under a high commissioner. That's why you see uh, the lion of the Ionian Islands, obviously derived from the lion of Venice and Britannia on the other side of the uh, coin. Uh, later on, uh, a, famous, uh, a famous high commissioner was, of course, uh, Gladstone, uh, a great Hellenist, among other things. But at the time of, uh, at, at, uh, at the earlier time, Kapodistias even went to London to have the high commissioner changed. That was Maitland, I think, who had been in India before. Kapodistias had drafted the original constitution of the Tinsula Republic in 1800, the so-called Constitutione Byzantina, and was uh, where he was also born. Therefore, Kapodistrias and Castlereagh to start to discuss not only the Greek situation, but also constitutional matters. The concern that Castlereagh had for revolutionary movements within the Ottoman Empire is clear. By his appointment of the new ambassador to Constantinople in 1819, precisely the time when Kapodistrias and Castlereagh are writing to each other and seeing each other. 
he chose Viscount Strangford. He replaced the English ambassador with an Irish one. His title recalls the name of the loch on which Castlereagh grew up in Northern Ireland. Indeed, it was Viscount Strangford who wrote to the Ottoman court, saying that the United Kingdom would suspend diplomatic ties over the events of the Patriarchate in Constantinople, the hanging of uh, Patriarch Gregory V, and the massacre of Kios. So there was an official complaint um, provoked by Castlereagh, who asked the ambassador to um, remonstrate. One should not forget a further element. Castlereagh's opposition to the French Revolution stemmed from his personal experience. He had followed the, the debates in person. He was in Paris in 1791 in the, in the assembly with great interest. But during the second coalition, the revolutionary troops had landed in Ireland in 1798. The French uh, government, the Directoire, had recognized an exiled king as new ruler of Ireland in case they had won. Moreover, during this time, his local town, Newton Arts, had been occupied and set up a committee of public safety, uh, modeled on those of revolutionary France. This gave him a different attitude to those living in England who had not dealt with uprising and invasion in their own lands since 1688. In such situations, the rule of law becomes central focus. It may be for the turbulent history of Ireland that he and Burke both agreed that legal stability is what creates prosperity. The de facto recognition of Greece may stem from his friendship with such persons as Capodistrias, or even some form of Hellenophilia. But it was mostly practical. Only 50 years before, uh, one has to remember, Castle was very good at reading maps. Only 50 years before, in 1783, uh, Russia had conquered Crimea, and therefore the Black Sea was now mainly divided between Russia in the north and Turkey in the south. Kalsori's notes for the Congress of Verona, which are mostly focused on the Ottoman Empire, are clear that the independence of Greece was to contain the expansion of these two powers uh, within the Balkans. To conclude and to return to poetry, one of Byron's criticisms of Castle was that he was unclear and his, in his speech and his writings. And this here, I quote the Don Juan passage, you see, I think I can explain myself without that sad, inexplicable beast of prey, that sphinx whose words would ever be a doubt, did not his deeds unriddle them each day, that monstrous hieroglyph, that long spout of blood and water laden castle ray. Indeed, uh, Byron was openly and directly involved in the struggle for Greek independence. Castlereagh opposed it until he could single out the Greek Revolution, not as an uprising like the ones he saw elsewhere in South America, Italy and Spain, but as a new nation ready to be recognized. His duty was to understand what relation the United Kingdom could have with the new Greek government. One may imagine given his good relations with Capodistrias between 1815 and 21, he thought such a recognition would lead to concrete diplomatic relations. One may term this a form of practical Hellenophilia. Gasseray was not a Hellenophile in the romantic sense of the word. He did not fight or write for Greek independence, but his understanding of the rapidly evolving situation in South America, Italy, and Greece made him single out only the latter, not as a revolutionary upheaval, but potentially as a new state with which to have diplomatic relations. Thank you very much. Uh, and now it's time for discussion. If there are any questions, we can start. Who's the first? Alejandro, please.
That's a simple question. What was the reception the class presented in Greece? So was the question directed to me? I didn't know. Sorry, was that question directed to me? I, I'm afraid I didn't hear it. Uh, it's a simple question. What was the reception of the poems represented in Greece? What was the reception of? The poems he spoke about in Greece. What was his reception in Greece? Um, uh, as I, I, I think I um, made clear, the person best equipped to answer this is uh, Professor Roderick Beaton, who has written the definitive work um, uh, on Byron and Greece. Um, but I, uh, I think the, certainly, as is testified by the numbers of um, um, commemorative statues, paintings, etc., and Byron was received very positively, um, and his contribution was uh, acknowledged as being of great importance. Um, I'm talking purely in terms of um, what it meant politically, rather than um, the way, uh, rather than any kind of reception of his literary works. Uh, you know, Byron was at the time probably the most famous writer in Europe. Uh, and obviously it was of immense importance um, to the Greeks to have a person with this reputation um, on their side. Uh, so um, certainly, uh, you know, I think, as I said in my talk, um, Professor Beaton's book shows that Byron did, it wasn't purely a matter of, of bringing his reputation and also um, helping with the Greek loan, the, so not purely a question of financial matters, but the question of his reputation, um, I think, was what was um, of extreme importance, certainly at the beginning. Um, I think, I hope I've answered the question. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, the poems. Ευχαριστώ πολύ κύριε Πρόεδρε. Ε, πριν να ολοκληρώσουμε για άλλη μια φορά, θερμά συγχαρητήρια στον Βασίλη τον Κουκουσά, τον συνάδελφο καθηγητή και πρόεδρο του Ινστιτούτου και φυσικά σε όλη την ομάδα, την οργανωτική και την επιστημονική που οργάνωσε το συνέδριο αυτό. Βεβαίως, θερμά συγχαρητήρια και στη Γενική Γραμματεία Απόδημου Ελληνισμού και Δημόσιας Διπλωματίας του Υπουργείου Εξωτερικών και προσωπικά στον Γιάννη του Χρυσουλάκη, τον Γενικό Γραμματέα, διότι έχει αποδείξει ότι τα τελευταία δύο χρόνια με τις άγνες προσπάθειές του και με τις δραστηριότητές του ενισχύει τέτοιες δραστηριότητες και βγάζει την Ελλάδα προς τα έξω. Επομένως, νομίζω ότι η συμβολή και του Υπουργείου Εξωτερικών της Γενικής Γραμματείας είναι σημαντική και σαφώ του Δήμου Θεσσαλονίκης, διότι έχουμε μια αγαστή συνεργασία σαν και σαν πανεπιστήμιο, αλλά και σαν δραστηριότητες στα αντίστοιχα τμήματά του που ενισχύουν πολιτιστικές, κοινωνικές και επιστημονικές εκδηλώσεις από όπου και αν προέρχονται. Βεβαίως, είναι ιδιαίτερη χαρά και τιμή να ευχαριστήσω τον Κοσμήτορα και όλους τους συναδέλφους από το Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο αλλά και τους συναδέλφους από το Καποδιστηριακό Πανεπιστήμιο για την συμμετοχή τους, όλους ο Διευθυντικούς Γκέστ, Διευθυντικούς Σπίγκερς, 
who are coming and uh, they presented uh, their scientific opinion on this uh, very interesting for us uh, subject. Με βάση αυτά, λοιπόν, κυρίε και κύριοι, αξιότιμοι κυρίε και κύριοι, θεωρώ ότι μετά από αυτή την τρίμερη συζήτηση αποδεικνύεται ότι ο φιλελληνισμό είναι ένα φαινόμενο πολυσύνθετο που δεν εξαντλείται προφανώ στι εργασίε ενό ή περισσότερων συνεδρίων. Υπάρχει ήδη μια εκτενή βιβλιογραφία, ελληνική και ξένη, που ορίζει, ορίζει γνωστέ και άγνωστε αναφορέ και παρουσιάζει μια δυναμική ανάπτυξη. Μάλιστα, ο περσινός εορτασμός των 200 ετών από την Επανάσταση και τη δημιουργία του νέου ελληνικού κράτους υπήρξε χρήσιμη αφορμή για την διεξαγωγή νέων ερευνών, συγγραφή μελετών, διαχείριση επιστημονικών προγραμμάτων, δημιουργία εκθέσεων και εκδηλώσεων. Άλλωστε, και από την σημερινή, από την τριήμερη αυτή, το τριήμερο αυτό συνέδριο καταδεικνύεται ότι πλέον στις μέρες μας η διεπιστημονικότητα, δηλαδή η εκκίνηση του κάθε επιστήμονα από διαφορετική προσέγγιση, βλέπουμε ότι όλοι είναι ιστορικοί ή ασχολούνται με την ιστορία ή ένα κομμάτι της ιστορίας, το οποίο όμως, ε, οι οποίοι όμως έχουν μια διαφορετική γνωσιολογική αφετηρία που όμως όλοι με τις γνώσεις τους συμβάλλουν σε αυτό που είπα και στο χαιρετισμό μου στην αρχή, στην διαλεύκανση ή τουλάχιστον στην ε, 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 κατάδειξη των θετικών από την Ελληνική Επανάσταση. Διότι προφανώς η ιστορία δεν είναι μόνο να καταγράψουμε τι έκανε ο Κροποτρόνης, ο Μότσαρης, ο Καποδίστριας ή οποιοδήποτε. Σκοπός είναι να διαβάσουμε σωστά αυτές οι δράσεις, το πώς εμφανίζονται σήμερα. Το συνέδριο λοιπόν αυτό δεν αποτελεί μια σύνοψη των πληροφοριών που είδαν ή ξαναείδαν το φως δημοσιότητας για τον φιλελληνισμό, ούτε μια επικαιροποίηση της υπάρχουσας εργογραφίας. Φιλοδοξία του ήταν να συμβάλλει στον προβληματισμό σχετικά με την πολυσχηδή φύση του φαινομένου, που όλο και επιχειρούμε να το ερμηνεύσουμε και όλο μας διαφεύγει κάτι. Ίσως όχι σε μία απάντηση, αλλά σε ένα ερώτημα. Μπορούμε να μιλήσουμε για φιλελληνισμό ή φιλελληνισμούς. Πολύ σημαντικό. Έχει κοινά στοιχεία ο φιλελληνισμός των Ιταλών του 19ου αιώνα με τον φιλελληνισμό ενός Ιρλανδού, όπως ο Τζέιμς Έμερσον. Ποια είναι η πρόσληψη της Ελλάδας για τους Αμερικανούς φιλελληνες και σε τι ταυτίζεται, αν ταυτίζεται, που προφανώ όχι, με την αντίστοιχη του βαβαρού φιλέλληνα Φρέντερικ Θρίερση. Πώς προφέρετε, in German pronunciation. Θρίερση. 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 Εξελληνισμένο. Πολύ ωραία, κύριε καθηγητά. Υπάρχουν απαντήσεις σε πληθυντικό αριθμό για αυτά τα ερωτήματα και όχι μία απάντηση. Παραπέμπω λοιπόν αρχή γενομένη στην ορολογία που συζητήθηκε πολύ στο συνέδριο, δίνοντα έμφαση στην εισήγηση του καθηγητή Φραντσέσκο Σκαλόρα και στην υπενθύμησή του ότι ο όρο δεν ανήκει στον 19ο αιώνα περισσότερο από ότι ανήκει στον 17ο. σω η μεγαλύτερη συμβολή του φιλελληνισμού από καταβολή του να είναι ότι αναγνώρισε και υπογράμμισε τη διαφορετικότητα ενό λαού μέσα στη Χωάνη του Οθωμανικού κράτους, δίνοντάς του εθνική υπόσταση, όταν η μακρά κοινή διαβίωση δημιούργησε συχνά την εντύπωση μιας ομοιογένειας, όπως μας θύμισαν η κυρία Τατάγια και η κυρία Μιχαήλ, κάνοντας επισκόπηση των εντυπώσεων ξένων περιηγητών του μακεδονικού χώρου. Τα, τα προσωπογραφικά όρια και η περι, περιπτωσιολογία του φιλελληνισμού τέθηκαν από τον καταξιωμένο καθηγητή Ρόντερικ Μπρίτον, ο οποίος μας πρόσφερε ένα πανόραμα τύπων από το τάγμα των φιλελλήνων του 1822 έως τον στρατηγό Σανταρόζα και από τον εθελοντή μισθοφόρο Τόμας Κόχραν ως τον ποιητή Σέλλη. Για κάθε ένα από αυτούς τους τύπους, τους τύπους φιλελληνισμού είχαμε την τύχη να ακούσουμε ειδικότερε συζητήσεις Για τον Αμερικανό α, φιλελληνισμό μας ανέπτυξε ο καθηγητής Μανώλης Γεωργούδης για μια σημαντικότατη πρώιμη 
βυρώνει αναφορά στα γλυκά του, α, του Παρθενώνα που κατέκλεψε ο Λόρδος Έλγιν, μίλησε εκτεταμένα ο καθηγητής Χρυσόστομος Σταμούλης. Την Ιρλανδική περίπτωση μέσα από το έργο του James Emerson γνωρίσαμε μέσω της εισήγησης της ερευνήτριας Αλεξάνδρας Φίν. Και ακόμα, η Ιταλική θεώρηση του μαχόμενου φιλινισμού, όπως προκύπτει από ένα ανυπόγραφο έργο περιπετειών ενός ξένου στην Ελλάδα, εξυπηρετήθηκε από την ανάπτυξη του καθηγητή Στάθου Πίρτακα, ενώ ο βαβαρικός φιλινισμός, μιας προσωπικότητας όπως εκείνη του Φρίντερικ Τρίερς, στη συνάντησή της με τον φοιτητή, ακόμα, Θεόδωρο Βρυζάκη, από τους καθηγητές Ιάκωβο Μιχαηλίδη και Θανάση Χρήστο. Την πρόσληψη των μαχόμενων φιλελλήνων από τον ελβετό φιλέλενα Ενρίκο Φορνέζη, ο οποίος έγραψε κατάλογο με βιογραφίες φιλελλήνων, παρουσίασε η δόκτωρ Αλαστασία Τσαγκαράκη. Και εν τέλει ενδεικτικό και άκρος εντυπωσιακό το ότι ο Φορνέζη αυτοχαρακτηριζόταν υπερασπιστής του επιτελείου των φιλελλήνων, μιας απτή στρατιά που έφτασε ως τη Βόρεια Ιρλανδία κατά τη διάρκεια διεθνοποίησης του ελληνικού ζητήματος, όπως μας θύμισε ο δόκτωρ Φρέντερη Λαουίντζε. Αλλά υπάρχουν και πρακτικές διαστάσεις της υποστήριξης των φιλελλήνων. Η απελευθέρωση ερμαλώτων, η υποστήριξη και η προστασία των προσφύγων. Για την πρώτη είχαμε μια μελέτη περίπτωση εκείνη του Αρχιεπισκόπου Δημητρίου Σουλήμα. Για τη δεύτερη είχαμε τη στατιστική καταγραφή του ελληνικού προσφυγικού στοιχείου στη Γαλλία τη δεκαετία του 2021, καθώς και την υποδειγματική εξέδεση του τρόπου με τον οποίο το γαλλικό κράτος αντιμετώπισε την αύξηση του αριθμού της ελληνικής καταγωγής προσφύγων στο εδαφός του. Αγαπητές φίλες και φίλοι, στο πανόραμα της Επανάστασης, με τα φωτεινά και σκοτεινά σημεία του, σημαντικό μέρος καταλαμβάνει το φιλελληνικό κεφάλαιο και μάλιστα με τρόπο άρρηκτα συνδεδεμένο με τις τύχες των ηρώων, των πρωταγωνιστών, αλλά και συχνά των ανώνυμων ανάμεσα στον πλήθο. Ένα από τα πολλά σαφώς συμπεράσματα που μπορεί να κρατήσει ο καθένας από τη συνάντηση αυτή είναι η διαρκή επαφή πριν την Επανάσταση, κατά τη διάρκεια τη και μετά προ τη δημιουργία ανεξάρτητου ελληνικού κράτου. Η διαρκή επαφή του ελληνικού στοιχείου με το ευρωπαϊκό, στα πρόσωπα, στι ιδέε, στι συνεργασίε και ακόμα στι αντιπαλότητε, στι αποφάσει, στι υποχωρήσει, στου συμβιβασμού. Ασφαλώ, μέσα σε αυτό το πλαίσιο διαμορφώθηκαν οι πολιτικέ και ιδεολογικέ συνθήκε του ανήκομεν στην Δύση. Μια αρχή που διαχρονικά προσανατολίζει το ελληνικό κράτο, φτάνοντα ω τι μέρε μα πέρα και πάνω από τι όποιε αμφιταλαντεύσει. Βέβαια, νομίζω ότι στο σημείο αυτό, ε, επειδή έλειπε την πρώτη μέρα, δεν ξέρω εάν ελέγχθη, νομίζω ότι όλε ε, πολλά από αυτά τα οποία συζητήθηκαν, αναφέρονται, έχουν αναπτυχθεί στο ελληνικό ζήτημα στην Ελληνική Επανάσταση, χρήζουν σήμερα, μάλλον έχουν σήμερα και την άλλη μια ιδιαίτερη αξία εξαιτίας της βοήθειας, και θα μιλήσω στον Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο, της βοήθειας την οποία παρέχουμε στον δοκιμαζόμενο Ουκρανικό λαό και στους φοιτητές που προέρχονται από την Ουκρανία και σπουδάζουν στο Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο, πράγμα λοιπόν που σημαίνει ότι όλος ο φιλελεύθερος δημοκρατικός κόσμος θα πρέπει να στηρίξει, δεν μιλάω πολιτικά, δεν μιλάω θρησκευτικά, όμως ακαδημαϊκά και ανθρωπιστικά, να στηρίξει και νομίζω ότι θα πρέπει και όλα τα συνέδρια τα οποία πραγματοποιούνται και συμμετέχω σε όλες, όλη αυτή την περίοδο και ακούω και από τους συναδέλφους, όλα αυτά τα συνέδρια θα πρέπει να ενσκύψουν με τα συμπεράσματα, αλλά τουλάχιστον με το μυαλό και με την καρδιά και στον δοκιμαζόμενο ουκρανικό λαό. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Φτάσαμε στο τέλο λοιπόν με αυτήν την ευκαιρία. Θα ήθελα να σα πω να ευχαριστήσω από καρδιά τον πρόεδρο του Ινστιτούτου, τον καλό φίλο και συνάδελφο Βασίλη Κουσά και όλη την επιτροπή που εργάστηκαν προκειμένου να ετοιμάσουν αυτή την όμορφη προσπάθεια. Ο ποιητή στο Μασέλιο του Ινστιτούτου του Ινστιτούτου του αλλά και η Μάιεν τη Μάιντι Γίνη. Η αρχή μου είναι στο τέλο μου, αλλά και το τέλο μου είναι στην αρχή. Thank you very much, all of you, for the great moments which we lived together the last three days. Εύχομαι 
να τα δώσουμε ξανά σύντομα. Κύριε Πουτσέ, κύριε Πρόεδρε, παρακαλώ να κλείσετε το σύνδεσμο. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Εδώ ολοκληρώνονται οι εργασίε του συνεδρίου μα. Το οποίο θα το θυμίσω και πάλι είναι προϊόν συνεργασία του Ελληνικού Ινστιτούτου Βυζαντινών και Μεταβυζαντινών Σπουδών τη Βενετία με το Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο Θεσσαλονίκη, με το Δήμο Θεσσαλονίκη και υπό την αιγίδα, τελεί υπό την αιγίδα τη Γενική Γραμματεία Απόφυλη Ελληνισμού και Διπλωματία. Με μεγάλη μα χαρά και τιμή υποδεχθήκαμε του συναδέλφου που μπόρεσαν να έρθουν εδώ, τον κύριο Πρίτανη, ο οποίο μα τίμησε με την παρουσία του τον Κοσβήτορα της Θεολογικής Σχολής, συναδέλφους από το ΕΚΠΑ και από ε, την, το Πανεπιστήμιο της Θεσσαλονίκη, φυσικά και από άλλα πανεπιστήμια ε, της Ιταλίας και του εξωτερικού. Ε, δεν θα πω περισσότερα γιατί όντως ε, η κατακλείδα του Πρίταν ήταν καθοριστική. Όλα αυτά τα οποία ε, το συνέδριό μας πραγματικά εξέτασε και μελέτησε αυτή την περίοδο, καταγράφηκα με έναν τρόπο Σαφή, εδώ είναι ένα θέμα ανεξάντλητο, αλλά πραγματικά θεωρώ ότι η συνεισφόρα όλων ήταν καταλητική στο να δώσουμε μια νέα διάσταση και πληροφορίε οι οποίε ε, ίσω ε, δεν γνωρίζαμε. Ελπίζω να έχουμε τη δυνατότητα στο μέλλον και για άλλε τέτοιε ε, συναντήσει. Σα ευχαριστώ και πάλι. Ε, εδώ στην ουσία ολοκληρώνω το συνέδριό μα ενημερωτικά για όποιον και όποια θέλει. Νομίζω αξίζει ο κόπο να πάμε δί, δί, δίπλα στο μουσείο που έχουμε των Βυζαντινών εικόνων, όπου φυλάσσεται το περίφημο της τόρμα του Μεγάλου Αλεξάνδρου, να σας δίνει μια σύντομη έτσι, ξενάγηση και μετά ε, ακολουθούν τα υπόλοιπα. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ και πάλι. Και την κοινή σας ευχαριστώ. Να, να ευχαριστήσω εκ βάθους καρδιάς τα παιδιά μας εδώ, τους υποτρόφους και τους θερασμιακούς φοιτητές, οι οποίοι όλα αυτή την περίοδο έτσι με υπέρμετρο ζήλο πραγματικά και ξεπερνώντας τον εαυτό τους, βοήθησαν και αυτοί ώστε να ολοκληρωθεί το συνέδριο καθώς και τον κύριο Θωμαχάκη που είχε την τεχνική επεξεργασία του κύριο Θεκλουργιανάκη. Σας ευχαριστώ μέσα στην καρδιά μου.